Tell them come get us. CT Kia boys in the city and they still can't catch shit. If you were to raise kids right now, what's the main thing you'd tell them as far as steps for success in life? Go get you any flat hat, any USB cord, and go get you any car you want. Whoa, Nigga, you in CT, BPT, you know how we do it over here. Big 203 shit. And BPT stands for Bridgeport, right? Yeah, CT Kia Boys. You'd be surprised when you first do it, for real. You're like, how is that so easy? For me, I could take that shit down in one shot. So it takes 10 seconds. My name is Andrew, a journalist from Seattle, and for the past couple years, I've been following an online trend called the Kia Boys, after I first discovered a documentary by Tommy G, filmed in Milwaukee. Hey, watch this, watch this, watch this. Depicting brazen teenage car thieves who seem to be able to steal Hyundais and Kias with nothing but a flathead screwdriver or a USB cord. And very quickly after their discovery, the Kia Boy method and Kia Boy culture spread from Milwaukee across the entire country and broke headlines nationwide. The next time you see a Kia or a Hyundai with a broken window, and without a license plate, it's probably a stolen car. Have you heard of Kia Boy's car thefts? The screech of stolen cars can be heard ripping through roads. Is people running for their life up there, dude? Terrorizing residents and catching the attention of police who increasingly are chasing down teenagers following an online trend, stealing cars and posting videos of their joy rides. In an effort to learn more about the Kia Boys, I went down a strange social media rabbit hole into secret group chats with Kia Boys from different cities around the country, many of whom seem to operate in plain sight without fear and had public Instagram profiles and TikTok pages where they documented themselves from a first person perspective, stealing Kias, joyriding, and of course, crashing them. But among the hundreds of active Kia Boy pages, there was nobody quite as fearless and brazen as the Connecticut Kia Boys. <laughs> Every day, they posted two or three new cars and seemed to enjoy engaging Connecticut police in high-speed chases. Or take that nigga to New Haven. At first, I thought this was some kind of joke page, and maybe the Kia boys were just being funny and using Connecticut as a locational decoy to mislead police. After all, Connecticut, known for beautiful Yale University and Manhattan commuters who live in luxurious mansions upstate, isn't exactly what comes to mind when visualizing a playground for petty auto theft. But after some research, I was able to make contact with the ringleader of the Connecticut Kia Boys, a perhaps Caucasian young man named Swervo, who agreed to meet with me in the backyard of a construction site for an introductory interview. Yo, I'm YK Swervo. 29 Trench. Nigga, I'm CT Kia Boys. CT Kia Boys, we're on top. No other Kia Boys competing with us, you know what I'm saying? So what does it mean to be a Kia Boy? To be a Kia Boy, bro, I feel like a lot of y'all get it wrong, bro. A lot of y'all just think y'all could take these cars or like, y'all doing these cars, y'all going like, for me, one minute chases and y'all crash, y'all get booked. That is not a Kia Boy, nigga. You take a Kia, you get lit, nigga. <laughs> not get caught. This is not what we do. CT Kia boys do not get caught. Hello? So for you, what got you started doing this, bro? Yeah, I don't know. I just started doing it, feel me? Came with the money. So it's primarily a money-making endeavor. Yeah. What about you? I started just because some, someone left their keys in the car, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, bet. And then, you know what I'm saying? I was scrolling on uh, Instagram, actually, and I see some TikTok shit of them taking the V. I was like, oh, that's how you do it? Fire in the hole. So I was like, bet. It's crazy. At first, yo, we really started on some, oh, everybody doing this shit. We could probably get pop. We could just do this shit, see how it works. And they was like, yo, we should record this shit. We could get lit. <laughs> Nigga, 40,000 followers later, we're the biggest on IG. As the CT Kia Boys Instagram following has grown, so have the number of car thefts in the New Haven area. In fact, they've nearly tripled since their page launched in early 2023. And local news anchors blame TikTok. The TikTok challenge has gone too far. My ignition is busted. My whole car is dented in. But it was what happened after her car was found that shocked her. The CT Kia Boys 
Lindsay's Instagram page. She had multiple pictures and videos of her car being driven by what New Haven police say are a group of miners. So Connecticut is, you know, kind of emerging on the map as like the center of the Kia shit because of you guys. Hell yeah, Hell CT you up, you know what I'm saying? You know what we did, bro. Y'all know what's going on, You know what I'm saying? You gotta remember us. Steady talking about you ain't coming to the party without y'all smack. They're called the TikTok Kia boys. Kia boys. Kia boys. The news likes to target TikTok. So whatever's on TikTok, they're gonna say that's a TikTok trend, that's a TikTok challenge, uh, but this yeah. shit was never for TikTok. No. TikTok trends are making Kia owners nervous. It's a trend on TikTok, a how-to on stealing Kias and Hyundais. The thefts are a viral criminal sensation popularized by social media posts on TikTok. 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 On TikTok. We never did this for the internet. We just found out an easier way to steal cars, you feel me? For those unfamiliar, what is the method? Nigga, all y'all boys need, man, one of these, yo. Y'all need one of these? <laughs> Everybody over here got a screwdriver. And we, bro. We this is your best friend, bro. You guys all have screwdrivers. Hell yeah. For me, you hop in that shit, put that shit right under the yo. Windshield wiper, you break that hole. Nigga, you get it sometimes in one, sometimes you need to put that shit in the ignition, you break that shit off. Grab y'all USB, grab y'all screwdriver, it depends on what type of car it is, and then we out. You you be surprised when you first do it for real. You're like, how is that so easy? For me, I could take that shit down in one shot. Yeah. So it take 10 seconds. But sometimes the ignition will stay and don't come off in one shot. So you just stick it in the ignition, boom, done. So how many Kias numerically do you think you've been able to steal in the past year? I see my car play. Like how many cars you've connected to on that iPhone? Mm-hmm. And I said, this isn't even all of them. This is how easy it is. Holy shit. Always had a V. You see Kia, Kia, Sonata, 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 Tucson. We be in Tucson's a lot. We always chasing money, you know what I'm saying? We go out, jug, we always trying to come up, you feel me? When interviewing career criminals, they always say they do it for the money. But one question I like to ask is, how do you spend the money? For example, in Philadelphia, when I interviewed two brothers who were in charge of manufacturing Trank, an oftentimes lethal fentanyl horse tranquilizer hybrid that can make your arms fall off, they said, we do it for the money. I like money, I like money. But they almost always spend this money on the dumbest shit imaginable. What's your favorite way to spend money, like, after you get it? Bitches food, right, fancy cars, jewelry, Dodge Charger, Hellcat, right. Grand Cherokee. I like pastas, I like pizza, I like steak. I say most important land. I'm a land type guy. Oh, nice. I wondered how the Kia boys spent their earnings. After you guys get money, how do you like to spend it? Shit, me. I'm coming up. I'm going to buy some purples, feel me? I'm going to get some shoes. I'm going to get dripped out, straight dripped out. And I'm finna go cop me a big ass pack, too, literally. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. You you need some vans. You need some hoodies, purple, Amiri, LV, all fight. Kasubi, oh, fucking Centros, Mad Brands, feel me? One of y'all want to sponsor us, hey man. I'm trying to get a sponsorship with Nike, yo, them new waterproof Air Forces. Yo, we gonna need them. Yeah, these are the Kia, this is the official Kia boy shoe, Black Forces. Black Forces are pretty universally known as a crime shoe. <laughs> It seems that the deep state of metrosexual European fashionistas have been truly successful in their 15-year plan to achieve psychic control over the minds of America's inner-city youth by paying rappers to wear overpriced designer bullshit and by means of idol worship have effectively turned their useless garments into status symbols that are only recognized by the ultra-poor and uber-rich. But that's besides the point. As somebody who's never actually stolen a car, the hardest part to me seems like reselling the car and not getting caught doing it. Now, the, the hardest part seems to be like, in my mind, selling the car sounds pretty difficult, right? Nah, that's easy. Everybody want a V. V is Kia Boy slang for vehicle. Now, if a car sells for like $25,000 market, how much do you get if you resell it on the black market? It depends what it is. Like a Kia is going to go for less. Oh, yeah. If it has all the windows, it's going to go for more. You feel me? Or well, if you have some key shit, it's going to go for even more. Like, even like, again, like you said, we get some key shit. You sell that shit for like 500 That shit only took us 20 minutes to go get. 500 bucks for a cut down Kia. Nah, we're a Kia, you only getting $100 in the hood for that shit. $50, that yeah, shit. Yeah, somebody wanna slide in that shit. Bro, right. they gonna go slide in that shit. Ain't nothing else. Yeah, you got them shits for 100 hit us. $100? $100. For a Kia? Yeah. Hell yeah. I couldn't believe they were reselling their Kias for $50 to $100 a piece. But it made sense. They said their primary customers were people in the hood who were going to slide, which means to commit a robbery or murder in said vehicle. 
and probably abandon said vehicle after the theoretical murder or robbery is finished taking place. It's not like the Kia boys are taking trips to the scrapyard or posting the car on Craigslist. They're essentially procuring getaway vehicles for older members of their community for a one-time use, which would explain why almost every morning after the Kia boys make off with a Kia or Hyundai, it's found abandoned somewhere in New Haven. But sliding and reselling aside, the Kia boys are essentially making McDonald's minimum wage with five times or maybe 500 times the risk. So if y'all can just do me a favor, just leave a bunch of money in y'all car for me, like, I'd appreciate it. Cause like I said, bro, that, like I said, the hey, task Fuck on scene media. Fuck on scene media. Kevin, Kevin Morris, Morris can suck my dick. You need to Where come get mother? us. I don't know what you doing. You need to come get us. I don't know what you doing. You lacking. Let me catch you with your V out in New Haven, you feel me? Who's Kevin Morris? Oh, Shit, some bro. fat ass nigga, some he a bitch. Bitch ass nigga, I know. Bitch. 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 And it was just his birthday, bro. I should have threw eggs at your V, like. Fuck that nigga and his birthday. And no, his birthday. Who is he, though? Like, what does he do? Bro, he posts. He, yo, he bro. thinks he's a cop. He thinks he's a cop, he like, he's he a, a weirdo. He a drug addict, turn wannabe cop. Kevin is like a Kia boy vigilante. He like a Kia boy hunter for real life. Yeah, that's his new name. Like, he a Kia boy hunter. Like, what the fuck go with you? This is where things start to get even more interesting. As we've learned from Batman, The Punisher, and John Wick, the true enemy of every shadowy crime syndicate is not the police, but a vigilante, a rugged anti-hero, an elusive arbiter of justice who lurks in the shadows and striking fear into the cold hearts of the capos, jefes, and gorilla pimps who prey on the weak for a little coin. And the nemesis of the Kia boys, apparently, was a self-described New Haven crime watchdog named Kevin Morse, who they said drives an unmarked Dodge Charger and uses drones, night vision goggles, and advanced GPS tracking techniques to stalk the Kia boys through the night. I knew that using the power of Facebook, it wouldn't take too long to track Kevin Morse down. And the next thing you know, there I was, face to face with the sworn enemy of the Kia boys. <coughs> My name is Kevin Morse. I'm the owner and operator of On Scene Media, New Haven County. This is a, a samurai sword. Um, I don't know, live by the sword, die by the sword. People try to intimidate me and threaten my life and all these different things. Um, to try to get me to stop doing what we're doing. That's Fuck on scene media. Fuck on scene media. Kevin, Kevin Morris can suck my dick. Fuck that nigga and his birthday. That's not gonna happen because I live by the sword and I die by the sword. So I will die before I stop on scene media and whatever we're trying to do with the fentanyl and all that. So how do you spend your days working for on scene media? Well, um, I would say that uh, we try to, you know, give the community that we serve, New Haven County, uh, real time, real information about what's going on, the crime. As soon as I wake up, I'm usually uh, several messages behind. Um, from the overnight stuff that came in and pretty much I open my phone and uh, we usually have uh, direction from there. So somebody's car got stolen, their dog is missing, their son or daughter's missing, the cops are over here, the fire truck's over there. So that's kind of it. I mean, I literally wake up to phone calls and messages and that kind of creates our direction outside of anything else we're trying to do advertising for people. Yep. So who are the Kia boys? <sighs> According to the Kia boys, Kevin has no idea who they are. Um, I would say that the Kia boys are small neighborhood groups uh, that uh, get together and, you know, they'll go, it seems like they go out 11 o'clock at night till like eight in the morning and just start popping door handles and, uh, you know, steal as many Kias and Hyundais as they can in a night. Look at this. But who are these kids? Young kids, uh, I would say between 11 and 16 years old um, is the core, uh, male and female. We got a crew right now calling themselves the Kia Girls. There's Kia Girls. Oh, oh hell yeah, yeah. but we oh, love yeah. our Kia Girls, but I shit like, Kia Girls, the Kia Girls just make this shit better for oh, us. Like, yeah, for yeah. shit, they bring a different energy. Oh, It blows my mind how anybody can commit crimes and then post them on their story or on their platform and it just be okay. The, the repercussions and the um, consequences, I'm not even sure what they are today. Um, you have people shooting people and basically walking right out of jail with low bonds. So I, it's bad. I mean, they, they, these hundreds and hundreds of cars are being stolen. 
Um, and not only that, the, the crimes that they're committing in these stolen cars. I mean, we watch them pull guns, showing guns, all types of things, uh, uh, damaging the stolen vehicles that they took. We posted a video where a guy it was broad daylight. The guy um, realized on his cameras that his car was being taken. He runs out the front door and jumps on the hood of the car, begging them to stop, and they take off. You know, it's all on video. That to me is insane that somebody even has to deal with that. What started to happen maybe like a year ago, we would post a stolen car on our page, make like a little flyer, and then boom, it would pop up on the Connecticut Kia Boys story, them in that car that we just posted. So they basically kind of mock us. They're constantly messaging us to try to get me to come out there and chase them and film them and record them, which is just not something that we're looking to do. This is a message that they sent me here. Yo, white boy, you're always got to be on the cop's dick. You must like they dick in your mouth. Go in the house. And it's getting to the point now where they're stealing cars calling me crashing the cars calling me so we can go cover it we're not we're not doing that nonsense you know i've been trying i, I message all they all message me on instagram just about every day threatening my life all types of stuff i mean i've literally been to where they've recovered a stolen kia mm -hmm. uh, the parents come to the scene and they pretty much sign some papers and they get released to their parents and then i've seen where the kid says f you mom I'm out. You guys' moms know you're doing the shit? Um, shit, low key, I don't even know. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. You think they'd be like disappointed? I feel me, I think, yeah. We need the parents of these kids to try to do something. I don't know, they're your children. The impact that it has, you know, I talk to all the victims. They call us to, to post their pages or post their car on the page people crying, uh, all types of stuff, you know, that the, they have to deal with. Um, everybody thinks because you have insurance, you're, you're okay, but it's much bigger than that. Is there a part of you that like ever feels bad for the car owner? Hell nah, because it just is what it is, you know what I'm saying? That's what insurance is for. Some people even ask us to take their keys. They're like, we got these payments, come take this shit. We'll leave it unlocked even, just total it. Yeah. Yeah, so we never really personally did that shit. But people ask us though, you know what I'm saying? But I never feel bad. Come get back, you feel me? Yeah. What y'all gonna do about it? It just is what it is. They recover from it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Everybody recovers at the end of the day. Thank Life goes on. As I learned in Philadelphia when interviewing the Trank dealers, almost every criminal has built up a fortress of mental justifications to protect them from guilt and responsibility in the suffering of others. In Philly, it was that drug addiction would exist with or without them, and if they stopped dealing, somebody else would just take their place. And for the Kia boys, it's all about insurance. And since 91% of cars in Connecticut are insured with complete theft protection, no harm, no foul, right? At the end of the day, I know y'all got insurance or for me, y'all y'all get back in a certain way. Again, like a lot of niggas for me, y'all y'all have jobs, y'all make bread, y'all don't gotta worry about it. Y'all niggas ain't come up from the trenches. At first, I honestly bought this explanation. I'd like to imagine that if I had my car stolen, I wouldn't take it too personally. I'd just keep pushing, file a claim, collect a check, and move on. But truth be told, I've never actually had my car stolen. And in my conversations with Kia boy hunter Kevin Morse, he explained to me that for Kia owners, even if they get their car back in just a couple days, the impact it has on their life is devastating. I was parked at work and I was there all day. When I went and got out of work, my car was gone from the parking lot. And what do you think happened? The kids were probably just casing the parking lot because there's no security there. Mm -hmm. So they just look for Kias. My car sticks out like a sore thumb, so. What the fuck you about, nigga? Fuck you fucking talk about, nigga? Fuck? Who are these kids? Local teenagers have nothing better to do. I don't really know the answer. The cops seem to know who it is, but they won't press charges. How did this all make you feel? Anxious. I'm mad. I've been a wreck for three weeks. I'm just not myself. I, I don't eat, I don't sleep, I'm afraid to leave my house. And why do you think having your car stolen had such a profound psychological impact on you? Because I feel violated. My sense of safety is gone, my sense of security. You know, they were in my car, they maybe know where I live, I don't know if that's their MO, but mm -hmm. it's just, I don't feel safe. It's just turned my life upside down. Like I don't want to go out anywhere, I don't want to go to the store, I don't want to do anything. 
Are you kind of pissed at Kia for making it this easy to get your car jacked? 100%. Kia should pay for, and Hyundai should both pay for all of this. Like the emotional stress that I'm under and what this caused isn't, you know, you can't replace that with money, but obviously with where I'm at financially, it would help. Yeah. But they're just dragging their feet on it. Did, did you uh, reach out to anybody else other than the police when your car got stolen? I did on C Media. Okay. Kevin at on C Media has been phenomenal. I don't know how he tolerates me. <laughs> <laughs> Midway through this journalistic mission, I started to resent the Kia boys a little bit and realized that I do have an emotional connection to my car. A 2006 Toyota Tacoma that I call Truckee. If you run the Carfax on Truckee, it's virtually valueless. Rebuilt engine, 200,000 miles on it, and the stereo is pretty much fried. But Truckee is my real fucking homeboy, and to be honest, I'd be kind of pissed if I saw someone dig a screwdriver into my shit, had no idea who they were, and then went on Instagram and saw them joyriding Truckee without asking Truckee's dad if they could even do it. And thinking more about it, I don't even have car insurance. But let's move on. I'm not here to examine the psychological impacts that car theft has on the mind. I'm here to understand the underlying motivations behind the Connecticut Kia boys. Surely there must be something deeper to them than a material desire for black air forces and Cartier buffs. After interviewing the Kia car theft victim, Swervo told me they'd just gotten a new V, this time though, a Mazda, and wanted to do another interview. Two boys up, man. Two boys up. Film yourself for the Hey guys, what are we doing? Yeah, just chill it, cool it. Hell yeah. Ain't a life, feel me? Yo, Kia boys up, man. They told me they'd spent the afternoon attempting to steal Kias and getting into police chases, a typical day in the life of the CT Kia boys. <laughs> Got into a little chases, turned up a little bit from regular day shit. How's today like level one through ten in terms of excitement? Uh this this was our like yeah, this was like a four. We could we could have did some more shit, feel me, but yeah. these is not clicking for some reason. What does clicking mean? Not busting, not opening, feel me? So you think Kia's doing a good job at making their shit harder to steal? Oh yeah, definitely now. Usually like the ones in the driveways and apartments don't got the update, but the ones in the street, people are gonna usually have the update. It was way easier before, now it's way harder. We can't hop on new Vs for us. Hyundai and Kia are holding events across the country to install free software upgrades aimed to preventing car thefts. Kia and Hyundai developed the software for millions of their vehicles. Even better, the software will be provided to vehicle owners free of charge. Attention, if you're a Kia or Hyundai owner watching this right now, if you go to a local dealership, they will install the new software update for free, which makes it so the screwdriver or USB cord trick won't work to start your car. What's up, YouTube? As we learned in the streets of Connecticut, it's a shysty world out there. And if you're a Hyundai or Kia owner, I want you to be safe. But more importantly, if you're surfing the web, I also want you to be safe from malware, scammers, hackers, and restrictive countries that don't let you go to the websites that you want to, homie. So straight up, I'm gonna keep it real with you guys. This episode is sponsored by NordVPN. Boom, you're in there. Keep loved ones, especially grandparents who aren't too well versed in cybersecurity away from malware and scammers. Boom, you're in there. Right now, you can go to www.nordvpn.com slash channel five and sign up for a two year plan with a huge discount by using code channel five. Like I said, it'll get you a huge discount and also four free additional months. That's four entire months, possibly 120 calendar days that you can use NordVPN at a discount rate if you use my code, bro. Protect your IP address. Boom, you're in there. Watch my movie on HBO from any country on earth and just say you're in America so you can see it on Max. Boom, you're in there. And hey, if you don't like it and you feel like NordVPN isn't really working or doing what we said it would do, there's a 30 day money back guarantee. So truth be told, it's pretty much risk free. All right, guys, back to Connecticut. You guys want to go to a bando? Yeah, we want to go to the bando. Yeah, sure, let's do it. The boys said they wanted to take me to an abandoned house where they like to hang out while skipping school. At this point, I realized just how young these kids may be. After all, only 15 year olds like to hang out at abandoned houses. I haven't hung out at an abandoned house since I was 15. I prefer to stay away from abandoned houses. Abandoned houses are where you go when you want to hide from your parents. I'm all set up there. Oh, okay, cool. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of like where you guys kick it at? Yeah, we just be chilling here. It's our little Kia trap house for me. One thing I wanted to ask them about was role models. 
It seems cliche, but at this point in your life, 16, 17, before you turn 18, is when having a strong male role model can really make a transformative impact on your life and keep you from becoming a degenerate adult. By guiding you with basic pieces of wisdom, like jail sucks, and you are 100% headed there if you do not change course. Like, probably really soon. Assuming these kids are underage, which I think they are, they've only been prosecuted thus far in the juvenile court system, which in Connecticut is very forgiving, and typically recommends behavioral treatment and mandatory GPS monitoring for children charged with auto theft. And so long as nobody was hit with the vehicle and there was no guns found in the car, juvie time is almost never recommended. But the moment any of these kids turn 18, the theft of a single Kia upgrades to a Class D felony, which is punishable by up to five years in state prison, which is a bad place to be for a 110-pound 18-year-old. Who were some of your role models like looking up to as a kid? Um, I spent a lot of time with my granddad. What was he like? Um, he was mad chill. My grandfather used to literally just sit in the garage all day. For me, he go for me, I go pop my tire, try to do some hot shit, go back to granddad like, yo, I need a new tube again. Like, <laughs> is he still around? Nah. Damn, I'm sorry to hear that, bro. Nah, I'd be chilling for real. Do you remember the last thing you said to him? It was, I love you. And it was crazy. It was like, I left that night, and for me, got that call, I was like, damn. What do you think he'd want for your life? Shit, I'm probably, he'd probably looking at me right now telling me, stop jugging like you tweak it, shorty. What would you say to him? Shit, granddad, you got to see how grandma doing. I'm about to make this bread. What about you, man? You had any role models growing up? Shit, no, nah, not really, feel me? What about your pops? Yeah, yeah. He not really no role my I don't fuck with that nigga for real. Has he tried to reach out to you like since you're getting older and Nah yeah, yeah. I, I talked to him a little bit, but still. I've had homies whose dads are kinda like popping in and out whenever they get to be like seventeen, eighteen. Uh, yeah. They try and reach back out and like explain, Oh, I couldn't be there for you because I had all this shit going on. Did you get you guys had any conversation like that? Yeah, bro, that shit like that's a mean conversation for every everybody and their father that haven't been around for a minute, for me. I still go to sentence. It's, it's kind of 50-50, you know, like some friends of mine have said, okay, I forgive you. I just want you back in my life now. And the others say, nah, fuck that. You, were, you weren't around. Like, stay, stay away from me. Yeah. Which one do you think you fall into? I'm not. I'm the second one for sure, you feel me? Yeah. Yeah. Like, fuck that nigga. Mud thicker than blood, you know what I'm saying? Do you guys see yourselves as like a family? Yeah, definitely. These, these my yeah, brothers. Yeah. How are you not brothers? If you're risking your freedom, you're risking your life with each other. You gotta depend on him to drive. Make sure you don't mat. You gotta depend on him. Do whatever, you know what I'm saying? Whatever you're doing in the moment. How important is loyalty in your life? That's the most important. What do you think really measures loyalty among friends? Sometimes even being out here isn't enough. Like you need to really be in situations. Like sometimes it really takes being in cuffs to see what the fuck is gonna happen. That's why struggle is not always such a bad thing sometimes because it really builds character and shows you who's real and who's not. A lot of these people, they got money, but they don't really got friends like we do, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you don't understand how we came up, where we came from, and, like, what we do, then you can't, like, you're not going to understand us. Like, you feel me? Like, Kiesha may not be us, but our come up is us. You feel me what I'm saying? All right, shit, you guys want to get down? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. We're gonna have some kids in the nighttime. All right. Cuisine. The most overlooked, underutilized purpose of Channel 5 programming. But boy, do we love to eat sometimes. And today, we're at Frank Pepe's Pizzeria Napolitana. We're at fucking Frank Pepe's with it, New Haven, Connecticut, pizza capital of the world. They told us to go to Sally's. We're not going to Sally's, we're going to Pepe's. As I entered the restaurant, I could already smell the maritime aroma of Atlantic Ocean clams being shucked to perfection. That's because this place is known for their white clam pizza, a wood-fired, mouth-watering delicacy that can only be found in New Haven. It's a whole family of clams on a piece of pizza. Embalmed in grated pecorino romano and oregano flakes, the family of clams is dusted in the perfect amount of flora with no fauna, which is a nice touch, but the spices undermine the garlic. Seven out of town. Came about the woods just like a hermit. If a tree falls down, I'll be the only one who hurts. What was that? All the beast things, so I know I'm not allergic. And the game warden always asking for my fishing permit. They bogus. Hi, yeah, hi, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, the clam is a little weird, but it's it's pretty new. 
Before I could even digest my pizza napolitana, I got a call from Kevin Morse, the Kia boy hunter himself, who wanted to take me along on a mission to drone a drug dealer, a regular pastime of his, where he terrifies local trappers by air by deploying a DJI drone above their stash houses. I was in. I met Kevin Morris in a nondescript parking lot on the outskirts of New Haven and entered his patrol car, which was stocked up with monster energy drinks, vape juice, and of course, a miniature samurai sword. Because I live by the sword and I die by the sword. So I will die before I stop on C media and whatever we're trying to do with the fentanyl and all that. I could have ripped it harder, but this thing will put salt on the vaping in a, in a sub on tank. Oh. What defines droning a drug dealer? Uh. Well, somebody sends us a message basically with an address and a description, vehicle, whatever it is. And then we get to the area, deploy the drone and try to lay eyes on it. And the psychological games that the drones play with these people, it's insane. They've told me it makes them crazy. So, so to clarify uh, the plan here, we're going to fly a drone into the sky. Yep. And we're about a block and a half from like a drug dealer stash house or uh potentially uh at least where they're trapping out of have you has this led to any like successful arrests before um i'm just gonna say yes you know, depending on what they're doing maybe we'll fly the drone right by them this drone is very loud and intimidating when you hear it when they see it they know we're around and i'm sure it, it throws them for a loop all right. straight, yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, straight. All right, all right, all right, slow down, slow down, slow down. Can you go to the right, Ernest? All right, look, this is where I want to see if we can spot any dealers here. Let's see. Um, back up a little, because you are... All right, there's the highway. Yep, yeah, that's good. Now turn. Look down at the street, because I'm looking, see if you can spot anybody. Oh, here's the store right here, okay. So this is another spot right here. So this is how good of a job we've done because they're nowhere right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, Kevin failed to locate any drug dealers, but it's okay, A for effort. Anyways, whenever night fell, I wanted to call Swervo to see what they were doing. Where are you guys at? Oh, I'm in Milford. Oh, I'm in Milford right now too. Yeah, we're just trying to find a good location. A good, like a good location to get a V? Yeah. Swervo told me to meet him at the Milford McDonald's and pulled up shortly after in the blue Mazda from earlier and told me to get in. Assuming the car was probably stolen, I threw my shiesty on and got in the back seat. Pretty immediately, he began driving erratically, swerving between lanes and truly living up to his name as we headed toward the state highway. It's all good. He poked his head out the window and began scanning the roads for cops. They said they'd had the car for over a week now. And after being reported as a stolen car to the local police, it was getting hotter and hotter to drive by the day. No less than two minutes into our drive, I began to hear police sirens. Perhaps naively, I assumed the Kia boys would just pull over and try to talk their way out of it, but no. Swervo dipped onto a service road and hit the gas, approaching 110 miles per hour. I got it on the highway. Yeah, he, he turned off the place already. Yeah, I know. By some stroke of luck, the cops stopped pursuing us. I'm not sure why. By this point, my adrenaline is pumping. Time seems to move in hyperspeed, but also slow motion at the same time. They're not chasing. I start to understand why the Kia boys like doing this. It's a special feeling to successfully outrun the cops in a high-speed chase. Had to turn my life all the way up. Had to turn my swag all the way up. Had to turn the bag all the way up. If it's smoke, then it's all the way up. We drive to the suburbs of New Haven, and Swervo tells me they're going to steal some Vs. At this point, I feel that I'm in a little bit too deep. I mean, it's one thing to get in the back seat of a potentially stolen car, but to actually accompany someone while they steal a Kia seemed a little bit too far. So I had to think fast. How can I get this footage without being an accomplice to a Class D felony? I decided to give my handy cam to Swervo's homie, who said he'd film their mission and give me the footage, and I'd follow close behind in my camera crew's rental car. As a disclaimer, Channel 5 does not condone, endorse, or promote auto theft or car burglary. Viewer discretion is advised. Swervo begins his mission by locating a Hyundai. Yeah. He shatters the passenger window with a special tool and clears the broken glass with his bare hands. Using a flathead screwdriver, he disables the lock cylinder, then goes to put a cheap USB cord into the ignition. 
I think he's got the update. He says the car is a dud. The driver recently installed the anti-theft software update. They had to find something else. Just a few cars down, he locates a 2010 Kia Forte and starts all over. After successfully activating the engine with a USB cord, Swervo's on the move, and I'm following close behind, genuinely curious as to what his plan is. Swervo begins driving as fast as he possibly can, then comes to a stop and tells me, it's time to turn up. All right, let's turn up. He kicks things into high gear, swerving erratically from left to right, like a madman, hitting breakneck speeds down residential streets, in a nauseating frenzy that lasted probably 45 minutes. After that, Swervo led us back to the highway and appeared to be trying to shake us. He later told me that we were making it too hot for them, somehow, and so got off at the nearest exit, headed to God knows where. A few minutes later, he called to tell me the Kia ran out of gas at a random intersection, so he abandoned the car and fled on foot. No, it's all good. We located the car near a cul-de-sac in Milford. Thankfully, it was recovered by Connecticut police and we're told was reunited successfully with its owner the next morning. I went back to my hotel that night feeling a bit puzzled. I mean, Swervo essentially just risked his freedom for a 45 minute joyride. And even if he'd been able to get the car back to the hood to resell it, he only would have gotten a hundred bucks. Kia, you only getting $100 in the hood for that shit, $50, that shit. Yeah, somebody wanna slide in that shit. I mean, that is so, so stupid. But this leads me to a deeper question. What kind of environments facilitate this antisocial criminal behavior where consequences seem obsolete? I mean, there's no noble Robin Hood alibi behind stealing a Kia or a Hyundai, like there might be if you were, I don't know, living in the slums and stealing Bugattis or Lamborghinis from billionaires or something. Kia is like Honda. It's a working class, fuel efficient car. And so this type of crime is all around just shitty and sad. For the victims, it leads to a collapse in social trust, which is the glue of a community. I've been a wreck for three weeks. I don't eat, I don't sleep. I'm afraid to leave my house. My sense of safety is gone, my sense of security. And for the perpetrators, it reflects a deep personal alienation and a hopeless search for status, meaning, camaraderie, and social media fame in a world without guidance. Nigga, we're the biggest on IG. Hell yeah, Hell, CT you up, you know, know what I'm saying? You know what we did, bro. Y'all know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Like... You gotta remember us. In a way, I kind of understand. All kids from every walk of life like to fuck around and get in trouble when they're teenagers. But for the Kia boys, this teenage chapter may unfortunately define the rest of their lives. Assuming they're 16 or 17, they only have about a year or a year and a half until they're gonna be charged as adults for the same crimes. And so the likelihood and the window for a retro bill style intervention is very, very slim, which is sad. I'd like to think that all human beings are not inherently bad. And even the worst among us are just healing unmet needs in some way. But I also know that some people are just shitty and view temporary personal gain as more important than the suffering of a total stranger. But that being said, in my personal interactions, the Kia boys didn't strike me as total sociopaths. In fact, they display a great deal of empathy for their own family members and also for each other. Mud thicker than blood, you know what I'm saying? He's, he's my yeah, brothers. Yeah. And so it's more likely that their personal alienation doesn't come as a result of a deep sadistic desire to cause pain to others, but rather environmental factors. The morning after our mission, I went to go visit the Kia boys in the housing projects in Bridgeport where they spend their time. A 36 building government built plaza of identical residential apartments called the Trumbull Gardens. Nobody there was above 25. There was no parents, no uncles, no moms, no grandmas, just youth. Every 45 minutes or so, the screeching tires of a fresh Kia can be heard driving into the gardens. Look at these little motherfuckers. 
Yo! Somewhere in this mix is Swervo and the other Kia boys who have cars for sale for a hundred bucks. In addition to cars for sale, there's also items inside these cars that are being pawned off. In a recently stolen Kia, there were DVD copies found of the Hangover trilogy and the movie Into the Wild, both going for about 20 bucks a piece. Despite obvious differences in music, fashion sense, and of course, slang, it's safe to say that this environment isn't unique. Every government housing project in America and the mentality it produces is virtually the same. Us against the world, get out by any means. But the roadblocks of financial illiteracy, the psychic influence of hyper-violent drill music, and the lasting legacies of mass incarceration and residential segregation have led to the genesis of a drastically misled generation who believe the only way out is petty crime or like rapping. The most popular rapper out of the Trumbull Gardens is a rapper named QB. Yeah. Yeah. All I smoke is dead niggas, all I see is dead niggas, all I smell is dead niggas, rest in peace your dead niggas, fuck with all this Facebook shit cause I heard what he said, niggas be jazzing and see me a person they duck it like they owe me bread. I know these kind of lyrics are common, but if you think about what he's saying, it's actually pretty fucked up and sad. Anyways, while the motivations of the Kia boys were becoming relatively obvious, one thing I was even more curious about were the motivations behind Kia boy hunter Kevin Morse. I mean, what would cause a 40-something-year-old man to insert himself as a vigilante in the world of Connecticut teenage crime? He thinks he's a cop. He thinks he's a cop. Like, you was a weirdo. You like a Kia boy hunter for real life. Fuck that nigga and his birthday. Can you tell us a little bit about your past? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I was born in Milford, and uh, around eight, nine years old, I have an older brother that was starting to experiment with substance, uh, alcohol, weed, cigarettes. Um, so at eight, nine years old, I was smoking weed, smoking cigarettes, and uh, when I was 11, I had gotten alcohol poisoning, you know, sixth grade, which is, looking back, just kind of crazy thinking of that. Um, when I was a teenager, uh, playing sports, I caught an injury and uh, was prescribed some Vicodin which I really loved at the time. And it just kind of spiraled into dealing drugs, doing and dealing drugs. That's pretty much all I did from, you know, 10 years old to 24. I was stealing a lot uh, from people that care about me, hurting the people closest to me. Some would say that I'm, you know, I probably got some people hooked on pills back then so we could do bad shit together. Eventually, after about a dozen charges, I had to go do some time. I was sentenced to serve uh, eight months uh, in jail. I paroled out and pretty much hit the ground running. I mean, I've never looked back only for growth. And uh, I became a recovery coach. You know, I participated in opening an 18 to 25 year old intensive outpatient program where I worked at for a couple years. And then all these parents that we started a support group with kept pushing me to start my own business. It all began to make sense. Kevin is a 12 step recovery guy who got clean through the program and left a life of drugs and crime behind to pursue a life of service, which is the third pillar of the NA and AA recovery model. Kevin mentioned that he himself got people hooked on pills so they could do bad shit together, something he obviously feels a lot of remorse for. I was stealing a lot uh, from people that care about me, hurting the people closest to me. The ninth step of the program is to make amends, which means recognizing harm done in the past and trying to repair it. But for those who've dealt drugs and possibly ruined the lives of others, that's not always possible. Many of Kevin's customers, I'm assuming, are now dead. So the program has an alternative avenue called Living Amends, where you take contrary action and make amends by doing the complete opposite of the bad things that you used to do in an effort to achieve karmic balance in the eyes of a higher power. In a sense, it seems that Kevin's passion for crime fighting is informed by his own guilty conscience, which thankfully is something he's honest and open about. That's part of the reason I do what I do, because I feel like I'm always going to be in debt to society for a lot of the crap and shit that I did, right? That I didn't get caught for or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so doing the stuff that I can do with on scene media and Lyft, um, you know, really helps me give back and, uh, you know, heal from the past, I guess you could say. Do you feel like your experience in jail was able to rehabilitate you? 100%. So in terms of your kind of long-term sobriety, what do you think is like the main factor that has made it so you've been able to maintain sobriety for so long? Exposure putting myself out there. You know, I, I don't fix what's not broken. So I've always kind of worn my addiction and recovery on my sleeve. Do you think you would have been a Kia boy? Hell yeah. 
<laughs> absolutely. At, at 12, 13 years old, if this was the way things were, absolutely we would have been stealing Kias and Hyundais. Channel 5 Live Worldwide, Hollywood and Vine. Fuck the authority, Channel 5 News. Channel 55, we don't fuck with Custers. And 5 is the best number. Fuck that nigga and his birthday.